Hi, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Ashley Jackson. I'm the Director of Membership Marketing here with the Florida Restaurant and Lodging Association. And today we're really excited, you know, to talk about Marketing Made Simple with um, PPK and one of our sponsors, um, Zenith. So, John, do you want to introduce yourself and tell us a little bit more about Zenith? Absolutely. Thank you, Ashley. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is John Weber, and I'm the Regional Executive for Zenith Insurance. And I'm so proud to say that we've been the endorsed workers' compensation carrier for the Florida Restaurant Lodging Association for the past seven years. It's been truly an honor and pleasure to work with Carol and Dan, the board members, and with all the insurance committee members for so many years. And I think we would all agree, no one could have really predicted the challenges that 2020 has brought our way. And I believe you could probably argue that the restaurant and lodging industry has endured perhaps the most hardship of any. And at Zenith, we insure more restaurants and hotels than any other class of business. Uh, we have spoken with a number of our policyholders over the past six months, and we have gained so much respect for your resiliency, your tenacity, and, and your trust, your trust that we'll all get through this together. And I'm sure that you'll agree that it's times like this where having a strong association be behind you providing support and guidance and certainly encouragement uh, is really important. Uh, I know that we have a number of policyholders on the call today, and I would like to thank all of you for, for your business. I trust many of you have benefited from the resources that we have made available during this pandemic. For example, just simple payment of premiums has been very difficult for many, as you can imagine. And as a result, we did suspend cancellations for non-payment or premium. Uh, we also created a very user-friendly online tool that allowed policyholders to make adjustments to their payroll as needed. We had some who needed to make two and three adjustments a month as our operations changed so quickly. We also have quite a few resources that will provide guidance regarding how to manage COVID-19 in the workplace. In fact, look for a Q&A with our safety and health leader, Andy Tatum. It's going to be in the fall issue of the FRLA magazine. And I know he's going to address a lot of the workplace safety issues that many of you are facing today. Finally, we are anxious to get back to some semblance of normalcy and to be able to attend many of the FRLA events in person that we miss so much. I know Angela Borthwick, one of our marketing leaders, she's on the call today and like the rest of us, she's anxious to get back and see everyone in person. For those of you who would like to learn more about Zenith and maybe even get a quote from us, quote for your business, uh, see Angela, see Tim Wenzel, I'm sure you all know Tim, or see one of the, the, the many insurance committee members, I'm sure they can all uh, give you the answers you need and be happy to assist you. Carol and Dan, thank you so much for this opportunity to sponsor this webinar. Be safe, everyone. And with that, Kim, I turn it over to you. Thank you so much, John. Um, so today, first, I want to thank our sponsor, Zenith Insurance, um, especially during these crazy COVID times and being so understanding. Um, without you, I'm sure that there'd be more issues with all of the uh, hospitality um, casualties, I'd say, because it's basically careers and, and businesses being closed. I really appreciate you helping sponsor this. <clears throat> so. Today, I'd also like to thank Florida Restaurant Lodging Association and Ashley, who's going to be helping us. And uh, if there's any questions, please put them through the questions and she will ask them at the end of the webinar because I'm sure there's some really good questions out there that these two, Amanda and Crafton, could answer. So I'm gonna actually start by saying, my name is Kim Kenny. I'm with PPK, I'm out of Tampa, Florida. We are a full service advertising agency. If you've been on any of these uh, recent marketing webinars with FRLA, uh, you've probably seen my other half, Tom Kenny. So uh, he said I was better suited and he's better for radio. So I'm, I'm actually taking over the moderation from this point forward. So um, I want to introduce Amanda Cox and Crafton Bryant. I'm gonna have them do a little intro about themselves and their career and their role of where they are. And so that you can kind of get some insight to where they've been and how they've uh, grown in their positions, and uh, well, then we'll start with the webinar and all the questions that we have. So I'm gonna pass it on to Amanda. Wonderful, thank you, Kim. Um, I am Amanda Cox. I'm the Director of Sales and Marketing at the JW Marriott Marco Island Resort. 
which is an 809 room resort off the coast of Southwest Florida on the beautiful four by six mile island of Marco. I have been with Marriott International for almost 20 years. Next year will be my 20 year anniversary. I was in operations for the first five years of my career, then transitioned into sales and marketing. Had the pleasure of working at a variety of our hotels and resorts from a Fairfield Inn and Suites to Gaylord Opryland in Nashville, one of our, our, our largest uh, hotels in the brand and have been in my current role um, uh, back with uh, Marco Island and FLRA since 2017. All right, Crofton. All right, uh, first of all, Kim, thanks a lot for the invite uh, to be on today's call. Uh, my name is Crofton Bryant. Uh, I'm the president of Shoreline Strategy, um, which is a, uh, a newly formed organization focused on helping small to mid-sized restaurant brands and, and hospitality uh, organizations uh, in the marketing space. I spent the past 15 years in marketing, uh, the past eight specifically in the restaurant space, focused on building out marketing media, public relations plans uh, for various restaurant groups, including Bloomin' Brands and, and uh, most recently with Metro Diner. Um, so I'm excited to be here and, and talk marketing um, with, with all of you. and again uh kim thanks for the invite no thank you guys because without your insight i'm sure um there would be more questions out there so we're going to get started then so <clears throat> let's start with the first question if you were thrown in the role of marketing because maybe your marketing director was furloughed or they you know they don't have the funds any longer to to employ them and you know that marketing is the first thing to go when when something goes awry so if you were thrown into that role of marketing today, either in a restaurant or hotel, where would you start? What would you do first, second, or third? And I'm gonna start with Amanda on this one. So I think there's a lot of people who are in that exact seat, right? Whether it wasn't their seat on the bus, or maybe they've always been in marketing and now they're, they're just having to market through this pandemic, which is enough of a challenge even for a seasoned marketer, right? So whether you're you're new or, or more seasoned, I think the first thing I would do is um, take a minute and breathe, which sounds, uh, says easy, does hard, but I think it's it's very easy when something's not in your natural wheel house to go into to panic mode. And I think one of the most important things to do first, if you're thrown into marketing something new, is just to take a minute to do an assessment. What tools and resources are available to you? Uh, what photography do you have? What assets do you have? What human capital and other parts of the organization or other potential partners are available to you? Um, I think the current times call upon us to be very creative. And it's hard for us to do that if we don't know what's at our fingertips. So I would start out by assessing your added assets. And then after that, I think it's really important to listen to your community. And that might look different based on what your business is. You might listen to your community through spending time in your restaurants or hotels. That might mean like really digging into the comments on your social media feeds. But I think your audience is going to tell you what it's hungry for. No restaurant pun intended. So don't just assume that what you're selling or marketing to your customers is going to be what it always was. Your community might be something totally needing something totally different than what it did last February. So again, I think go in there and assess what tools are available to you. Find a way to listen to your community and understand what they're asking for. And then match the two of those up in a short-term marketing plan. And I know we'll probably talk about that a little bit, you know, you know, further in our call, but I think Think within the next tiny 90 days. This is not the time, so to speak, to be looking at the summit of the mountain because the environment's changing too quickly. We just need to look at the next few steps ahead of us. What's the next right thing to do? But before you can even ask any of those questions of yourself, I think you need to know what you're working with and then what is your community of consumers asking? <gasps> Awesome. And Crafton, what do you think? You know, what would you do first, second, or third? 
<laughs> yeah, I think, I think Amanda hit on some great points. You know, I, I always say, you know, it's it's first, it's it's start to create conversations with your guests, whether it's a restaurant or hotel space. And instinctively, you could do that within the four walls of, of, of your restaurant or your hotel and you create that conversation. But take that to the digital space. Um, you know, look at, you know, Amanda mentioned, you know, reading reviews and listening, but use that as an opportunity to create that conversation and that dialogue um, to understand what your guests are going through and, and how you can get them back in. So it's a two-way street, right? It's communication back and forth. Um, it is same thing on social media, right? Um, you know, budgets are budgets are tough right now. I mean, there, there's no doubt about that. Um, so tap into some of the organic channels and create conversations and dialogue with your local communities. Um, you know, talk about things that are going on. And then, you know, I think that's all really important um, because it can help you better understand your business and not just where you're at today, but also maybe where you need to go tomorrow. Um, you know, we're in a world where, you know, the, 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 the guest is, it has such a big voice on the social media channels um, and, and review sites and other things that we can learn a lot about everything that we're doing and then turn that into um, actionable steps to, to better the business, uh, which does help you kind of look down the road. Right now, I agree, focus on the 90 days. Well, how can you get through? Um, the second piece I would say is community involvement. Um, you know, in the hospitality space, specifically restaurants, you know, um, I, you know, again, it goes back to budgets are lean. You know, you've got a community that supported, has supported you for X amount of time that you've been open or been around. Um, so figure out how can you get involved? Um, challenging times need good, good, good community partners. Um, and that, that builds a really great relationship between your business, yourself, and that local community that, that can help support you now, but uh, more importantly, set you up for, for great success in the future. Uh, and those are things that you can do with, without allocating big budgets to, to different media uh, you know, media or, or just bigger, more expensive uh, marketing and, and media tactics, right? So um, I think it's, it's, it's focus on what you can do, what's at your disposal, create conversations, have dialogue, digest, get better, um, and, and continue to move forward. So I'm going to, I want to expand upon this a little bit. Um, Amanda, you said know your community and how your community has changed. So when you're talking about your community, you're talking about Marco Island, or are you talking about the guests that are coming in from other areas because they want to get out of the urban environments that maybe, um, maybe it's New York, maybe it's Boston, whatever, and they want to come there to get outside. So tell me about your community, how it's changed a little bit, what you're, how you pivoted maybe some of your marketing towards that. Yeah, I think it's really both, Kim, and that's why I use the word community instead of diners or guests in the case of a hotel. Because it, you know, really the the community is everyone in your 360 degree sphere who has an impression of your brand, right? So for me at the JW Marriott Marco Island, that's everyone from, you know, my quote unquote traditional guests in either the Northeast or other parts of Florida, uh, international destinations who are certainly not traveling right now. But it's also the residents of Marco Island, right, who might patronize our restaurants. And also, how do they feel about travelers coming in at this time, right? So you've got to have that 360 degree view of your whole community. And I think for a lot of us, our communities have changed right for example we are transitioning into a time frame after labor day where in a normal year many of my guests would be from northern mid-america or the northeastern united states and we wouldn't see as much travel from say florida georgia and the carolinas we are seeing this year for obvious reasons that drive market really continue. Uh, we're seeing different patterns in, in local diners and, and those things in our restaurants as well. And so I think it's really important to not depend on the fact that your customer now was the same customer you had in February or last September. Really need to, again, assess before you can start marketing. Got to know who you're speaking to. All right, awesome. And so Crafton, that's a that's going to be further on because I know that the guests and the diners are a little bit different when you're talking about hospitality in a hotel versus a restaurant. So um, when you speak of like community and diners, how has that changed for the restaurant industry and how are they looking at it? Because I know that 
there's a lot of organizations and restaurants that that give back and they have been doing a lot of that when you're talking about helping the community i mean if you are a restaurateur and you're a small one what can you do really simply that would be more engaging for the community yeah right now i mean you you know when you're you're talking about a a, a local restaurant you're talking about your local community which is obviously much different than the hotel space um you know you're you know you're looking at you know how you how you evolve and, and, and change and and right now everything's moved to delivery and, and kind of this off-premise piece and uh, or, or has been moving that direction um so i think you got to be able to give the give, you know give your your guests the people that are in your community um options to dine with you in different ways whether it's like bundling packages for families or or that but then getting involved in the community i mean right now there's such an emphasis on first responders um specifically in the medical field right uh, you know that's a, that's a great way to, to sort of tie in is 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 doing some food drops um and, and you know it's again it's goodwill right but it, it it just it helps you to create that connection with the people that really deserve it they're they've been you know really you know a lot of times understaffed and overworked and put in these crazy situations and um you know to to just uh, have restaurants step up and, and and do something special for for those types of people um, but then also, you know, there's a lot of, you know, there's a lot of people out of, you know, out of work right now and different things. There's other ways to do it. There's a, uh, there's a concept um, that uh, I've been following. I've, I've not done work with them. Um, that started a, a thing called the Furlough Kitchen, and they've gone around to these different mar you know, markets. And um, I, I thought that was just a really cool concept that really got me excited because, you know, they were able to go and navigate around the different markets and that they, they had restaurants in and almost have a brand within the brand. And they were. They were feeding people, specifically in the hospitality industry and beyond, that 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 have been laid off, and that to me is just a really cool, different way to look at like how how do you give back? And and they're doing it on a larger scale, but but how can you do that within your community? Um, you know, if you're positioned in a way that you're going to be able to make it through these challenging times, and I know that's tough, and I know people are in roles that they're not typically in, you know it's going to pay off in spades. I mean, it really is. So um, I, I hope that answers the, the question there, because I think that there's a couple of ways to look at it. No, I think those are both great ideas and, and ways to see it from a different perspective, which I think that we always are used to seeing it from our perspective. And then when you hear it from a different person's perspective, it kind of might um, give them a little opportunity to brainstorm a little bit more about how they're going to market differently. So let's talk about social media platforms, because there's so many of them out there now. Um, which ones are you finding the most success for with organizations? And, and we'll start with Crafton on this one. For the organizations that you're working with and the restaurants you're working with, what are the best social media platforms that you're using and how are you using them? Yeah, there's there's still a sense of tried and true to, to Instagram and Facebook. Um, you know, Instagram, you know, showing, you know, showing food engagement, showing people's faces, showing excitement, you know, you know, when you're in the hospitality space. Um, I mean, it is, is a great way to engage organically without having to put um, a lot of money behind it. Facebook, you know, has obviously become and has, has, has pivoted to more of a paid platform, um, but you can still reach, you know, your, your, your followers, your fans um, and create those conversations. Um, TikTok, I mean, is there for the younger generation, for the concepts that have, you know, and there's a lot of controversy with it right now, but um, it's got a very young demographic. And, um, but I, I think right now, I think you, you stay tried and true. To, to what you're good at um, and think through what your content is. Even if you're not a marketing person and you're stepping into this role and you're trying to figure out, okay, now I gotta do social media, I've never done it before. Um, you know, a thing that I like to tell people that are in those situations is, okay, first of all, look at the people around you, look at your team. Um, because if you're in a restaurant or a hotel, I can guarantee you that you've got people that are, that are whether they're servers or, or they're a host staff or they're, you know, they're whatever role that they may be in. A lot of people have these really big social followings and, and they know their way around a, a, a an iphone camera um better than most photographers know their way around a you know a, a you know a nice photography camera right so tap into those resources and then create content that that re is relatable um and that isn't stale and stagnant so um you know you got to play around with it you got to look at look at what other brands are doing um look at you know what some of the big brands are doing look at you know, find find other you know find other restaurants, find other get outside the industry and look around, um, and take all that, take notes, see what you like, what you don't, 
um, and then and then try to capture and tell that story. Tell the things that you're doing, whether it be with the community or it, it be that you're you know you're you're doing bundles or you're you know you're focused on doing delivery. Or, and, and there's just a lot of different ways to do it. Um, but I think what it all boils down to is have fun with it. Um, and and that's that's the scary thing, especially if you're not used to doing social media. You're like I don't know, have fun with it. You know, and and, and that's again, there's a lot of resources online, um, but but. Follow, follow what some of the big guys are doing and just take take notes from their strategies and um, tell your story. So Crafton, a couple questions then on that one. What um, what platforms would you recommend for restaurant tours to look at significantly, like spend more time with in the beginning? Like if this I, is I really brand new coming to marketing, brand, which ones? Brand new restaurant space, I would, I mean, I would be really strong on, on Instagram, uh, but I would also say that you know, you can set Instagram and Facebook up. They're owned by the same company. And as a small brand, you can publish the same content to both platforms. And, and that's the approach I would take. And as you get bigger and as you have more resources, then you then you ultimately work to create separate communication plans within those. But right now you're you're down and dirty. You're getting into it. You're getting your hands dirty. Um, so so take advantage of that ability to be able to publish the most like multiple to Facebook and Instagram. But on you know, I would say food. Especially non non paid with organic reach, Instagram all the way. Awesome. And Amanda, so social media platforms, which ones are seem to be working the best for JW Marriott Marco Island? So I agree with Crafton. I think this is an answer where for restaurants and hotels, it's it's very similar. I think especially if we're like down and dirty, we're starting. I, I think you go Facebook and Instagram. They're very user friendly. I love the idea of sampling again if you've never done it from before look at what attracts you on your feed sample some customers people in your office that are different you know gender race age group right it what what attracts them right kind of get get that demographic going but the other thing i love about social media right now is i feel like it's very easy and visual to make people dream and here's what i mean by that I, I you know if we look at travel right now i think everyone's individual comfort level traveling or staying at a hotel right now like that that's very different like that's a personal thing getting on an airplane this is a personal thing but if i'm being really thoughtful in my content and highly visual and you see that content and Crafton sees that content. If you're ready to book a trip now, yeah, and, and Crafton is not, that content's not gonna offend either one of you. It's gonna inspire you to take action and it's gonna inspire Crafton to dream. And both of those are good things. So I think, you know, there's, we're all learning even seasoned marketers, how to do what's right now. There's not a playbook for this. We are uh, building the ship and sailing it simultaneously. So don't so much worry about how to do it right. Worry about how to do it wrong, really. And, and the only way you're going to be wrong is to be you know, really insensitive to the current situation. But outside of that, I think to Crafton's point, have fun, don't be intimidated by it. And if you have a little extra pocket change, which not everyone does in 2020, um, particularly for hotels, some geo-targeted social media ads um, on Facebook and Instagram, which is Crafton touched on are the same platform, that can be a very affordable way to see a quick return on investment. And I've talked to people who have never been in those positions that are so intimidated, and it's way more intuitive than you would think. I promise you, like a 10-minute YouTube tutorial, and you're like off to the races. Awesome. Well, we're going to go back to that. We have a little subsection of that a little bit later of, of social media. So, um, but on both of you, I will we'll go back to Amanda on this one because I know that social influencers are usually bigger in the hospitality hotel industry than other things sometimes. But you know, I know that the a lot of the social influencers that um, are in Florida right now, 
and they can't really travel anywhere. Are you engaging any of those to, to do any type of social influencing on social media? So we are just starting that again, Kim. So we were we were kind of um, dark in that space from the end of March towards May. We had plans, why you have a plan and then be ready to redo the plan. We had plans to re-engage in June and July and then just looked at what was going on with some of Florida's case counts. And that's a great example of what I was just talking about. It seemed out of tune to the moment, right? And, and I think um, you have to listen to that voice in the back of your head, especially right now when, you, when you're marketing. So we pushed um, our influencers out. That was the right decision for us and uh, resumed that again in August. And I think for hotels, that is another example of a really impactful and very affordable way to get your message out. So I would encourage hotels to not only um, evaluate those opportunities when they come your way, but also as you're checking out feeds, when you're, you know, kind of developing your social media plan, look at some influencers that you feel like might be a good match to approach about a collaboration. There are also influencer agreements that um, allow co-use of photography assets. And I know right now a lot of us have changed our operations, or our offerings because of what's going on in the world. And maybe you haven't had time or the budget to, to redo photography to show what you're doing right now. Um, and influencer partnerships can be a great way to not only help deliver that message, but also potentially get a little bit of a photography content research uh, at, at a trade versus hiring a photographer. All right, Crafton. Uh, don't mind the dogs in the background. Sorry. You never know what's going to happen. It's called a webinar and we're all working from home or, you know, somewhere. We're all doing it. <laughs> so um, if you were to have, do you use social influencers in, in the restaurant industry or do you kind of shy, shy away for that and do more of a viral type thing? No, I, absolutely. I, I, I'm a big fan of social influencers um, and I have used them pretty extensively in the past. Um, you know, kind of in a similar situation as we're kind of coming out of this, you know, is, is where um, I'll be working with some smaller brands on uh, getting involved with that. But it, it's a huge opportunity. And, and depending on the size and how many locations you have and, and is going to be who you want to target. But if you're if you're a local or a regional concept, it's it's really a no brainer. And, it, and it, it, it's it's very cost effective. And in most cases, in a lot of cases, really, what I've done in the past has all been earned. It's, you know, we, we provide the meal, we provide the experience. Um, and, you know, you have the, you know, the, the influencer maybe plus one in um, for, you know, a sampling of if you're running an LTO, um, if you're, you know, if you're sampling out, you could do if you've got bundles running right now, or you've got a new cocktail, um, you want to put that all in front of them, give them an experience. And I, and I love that Amanda touched on, on this is you can really get that user generated content. You can get their photography um, and you can amplify the message that they're putting out. Um, it, it's a great way to build up a bank of assets if, you, if you're not out doing photography yourself. So I think she hit a really, really big point there. Um, but it, it, get on, get on, get on Instagram um, and, and start, you know, looking around at your local, you know, looking at your local community, Jack's Eats, you know, you know, Tampa Bay Eats, you know, things like that. And, and you'll find these influencers and, in, you know, they, it, and they range in size, but don't just look at the size, look at their engagement. And what I mean by that is when they post something, how many people are, are commenting on it? How many people are liking it? Um, because I would say in the restaurant and hospitality space, you don't, it, you know, specifically restaurants, I, I think is more geared towards this, is it doesn't necessarily have to have this gigantic following, right? They've got to have, you know, if they have five to 7,500 followers and they're getting you know a good traction um they're a good they're a good you know person to you for you to use there locally um so i, I think those are the things you got to look at and, and and i would i would start reaching out to them proactively and things are starting to normalize there and, and, and invite them in um and you know it's and that will help you again it'll help you get additional uh photography assets it'll help you you'll be able to share their their content um, and it, it a lot of times can can help with some of that viral content that Kim kind of mentioned on, earlier as well. All right, so now we've talked about social media and we talked about engagement and all of those things. And you know, 
I know that we should probably set aside some time every single day of like an hour to engage with everybody that's on there, but you know, that, that likes our posts or whatever for when, on the business side. Personal side, different story, I guess. If you're sitting there at nine o'clock at night and you wanna go on your Facebook page and do that stuff too. But let's talk about customer reviews. Because in this time, we have some people that are really grateful and they're thankful and they're th praising you. And then you have others that are just, they're, they're just so far down in the dumps that the reviews just come across negative all the time. How do you guys position yourself and take on that, do you, I mean, do you respond to those negative reviews and those positive reviews to increase that engagement? I mean, I know that a lot of companies and want to take away the negative reviews, but is that, a, you know, should you? I mean, those types of things. So um, I'm gonna give that to Amanda. I want her to start with that one. So this is actually a great area where we've done some uh, big changes, Kim, in full transparency. We, but prior to March, engaged a third-party monitoring service to, to make sure that we were uh, very, very timely in both positive and, and negative and super active. And um, to your point about some of the first things that get cut, right, that that uh, was a, a contract that we cut. There's been how we've handled that is um, finding uh, multiple people throughout our organization that were interested in growing in either the marketing or communication space. And these are individuals in very different and non-traditional jobs. They're actually in the operation of the hotel, so they're not necessarily a part of my team, but they have an interest and a passion in this type of communication. And we held a little mini class and I did a little workbook on responses and here's some great language to lean into and kind of here's how we want to show appreciation. And then here's how, here's when we wouldn't want to respond. Here's when we would want to respond. So I think there is a way to put together a playbook for your team or a couple of people because let's be honest, the majority of our consumers have got some disposable time at home right now and it's lending towards more time to write reviews and more time to wait for a response. So I think it is important to thank people for the great reviews. Um, we all need a little sunshine in our life and it helps amplify those great reviews in the feed. So why wouldn't you want to take a couple minutes to engage in that? And then I think, you know, the majority of negative reviews warrant some type of a response or reaction. And, and cause the, you know, marketers have very different views on, on this because it draws more attention to it when you respond. And that's why I say certain things are worthy of a response. And I'll, I'll give you an example. If your parent company, your county or government has a position on the mask thing, right? Let's, let's take an uber polarizing subject. And you have a customer who gives negative feedback about the fact that you're following or not following a policy. I don't think there's a lot of good that comes in public engagement on that. If someone's giving you feedback on service, product, et cetera, I, I, I think that, that good comes from responding to that. And I, I would say, you know, there are kind of two ways to do that. There's publicly, so everybody sees the response. And if you have something that's been thematic or maybe that multiple people have commented on, that can actually quiet or de-escalate an issue is responding to it publicly. And then if you have an issue that's very isolated, right, that's where sometimes we'll invite someone to DM us, you know, let, let's, let's kind of take it offline and, and we'd, we'd really like to make it right for you and there's an easier way for us to have this conversation without the rest of the world watching. That's a great answer. <laughs> I love it. Crafton, all right, you know the routine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, so listen, uh, you know, we're no longer who we say we are, we're who the consumer says we are. Um, and, and, and they've got a really loud voice with these review channels. I said that earlier, I'm going to say it again, because if there's no, one thing you take away today, have the conversations with these people that are leaving reviews in the exception, if it's political or something like that, I, I do agree with Amanda's comments there. Um, 
if it's if it's a good review, acknowledging it is is a great way to just you know to show hey thank you we appreciate you taking time because somebody took time out of their busy day or maybe in the age of COVID not so busy um, you know day to to leave a review. If someone wrote a negative review, you want to be able to acknowledge it. You want to be able to resolve the issue. Um, and, and so I always I believe in acknowledging the review in the in the public space, so not direct messaging them. Because other people are reading these reviews, and when they see that you care enough to respond to these reviews, um, I think that shows a lot about an organization and a lot about it. And I, you know, and, and so then I would take it offline. I would take it to the direct mail, or I would ask them to reach out to you via phone or email or however you prefer um, to try to to try to earn their business back. Uh, we don't we don't want to just get business back. We want to earn it back. We want to bring them back in. We want to show them, hey, we had a miss here, but we believe that we are really good at X. So come back in and show them X. Um, you know, and I and I, I think the other piece of this is I I challenge it at least in the restaurant space um, that the person that should be digesting these reviews because you're if you're one location it's maybe 20 reviews a a week uh, across you know Instagram I'm sorry across Yelp uh, Google TripAdvisor etc. It should be the proprietor or somebody from the management team because what you can start to see is you start to see trends maybe the trends are. Um, an issue with a specific product that you're putting out. Maybe the trends are issues with a specific server. Maybe the trend is that you're getting complaints about a time of the day when you're not there. And, and so it can help you start to make better decisions on your business. And that's marketing, right? I mean, that, at the end of the day, it's marketing and operations when they come together. So, so use these reviews and, and not just responding to them and engaging with the, you know, the, the guests and trying to win their business back, but use it to better your business. And I'll tell you, you know, my prior life with Metro Diner, we had a, you know, a, 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 you know, we had over 60 something locations, um, and that was a primary way that we gauged operations. Um, I kept very detailed tracking measures on month in and month out of, of how we were doing in the review space. But then we also made very big foundational changes based on what the consumer was telling us. We changed, you know, products. We changed the like service uh, standards, things of that nature. So. Uh, there's a lot that you can learn, um, and, and when you're engaging back with every single person, it tells a big story about you and your organization that you care enough to take the time to do it. Um, I, I'd say my biggest takeaway today, um, if I have anything, is, is to is to listen, to engage, and and to have those dialogues with your consumers there. Awesome. So let's go on to the marketing strategy because there's a lot of people that are just, you know, they need a marketing plan. They've been thrown into these positions. They're now part marketing, part, you know, front desk, front front house, front of house, maybe, you know, chief dishwasher, who knows? So, you know, we need to have like an idea of how for them to build a marketing plan. And it doesn't have to be an extensive one, but a very agile one that will allow them to, I mean, as things change, because who knew that back in March we were going to be in this situation today? So we need something that's agile. So if you were to build a marketing plan for a, let's just say a smaller organization, because I know JW Marriott's a huge organization, but if you were maybe a boutique hotel, what would you, how would you build a three-month agile marketing plan, Amanda, to get them from A to you know B and C by the end of December? Like what would they need to be doing? So I think um, I think a 90-day plan is great. That's not saying that I uh, don't think we should be looking longer range. Goodness knows that we all we all should. But I, I think one of the most important things right now is uh, just the potential to pivot in a plan. And I think there's a reason pivot is such a 2020 buzzword. And and if we think about how different all of our lives were six months ago. How can we possibly attempt to forecast into the future? So I think there's three things you wanna consider. I think right now from a hierarchy of needs perspective, all of us have to create confidence in our consumers. Um, and, and I think it, it's, it's number one. And, you know, Crafton was just talking about some great ways you can do that and free ways to do that, right? Engaging with those uh, reviews, your social media channels, yeah. th those are important things to, to create confidence. I think considering in your plan that potential to pivot um, is really yeah. critical. I am 
you know, a lot of our marketing tactics in the past two to two and a half years have been very digital heavy anyway. But the real case for digital right now is that if you put something out into the universe and it doesn't resonate well with the customer, um, or in the case of a boutique hotel that might attract people from multiple areas or multiple geographies, if it doesn't do well in a certain geography, you can pull it back quickly and change it. So think about how fast our world is changing. I would be remiss to put a lot of energy and certainly resources into things that can't quickly change in their messaging. I, I don't think it's smart right now. And then finally, I would really look at ways of uncovering new demand based on what's going on in our world. There is nothing normal about 2020. Um, you know, right now it's fall. We've never had a fall where children didn't all go back to school or at least didn't go back to school normally. And, and so what does that mean for your organization? That's just one example, but that's kind of how we have to think. Think about what's going on in your own life and, and how that influences how you consume. Those should be the items that are influencing your marketing plan. So I think for very little to no cost, you can tackle some great social media efforts. You can get involved in those reviews that combined with listening to your your customers and your community like I talked about that's going to give you that quick are you even offering the right things right because marketing doesn't mean anything if we're not offering what our consumers want to consume so we're even offering the right things and and then uh, finally this influencer idea I think is a great low budget short term idea and then certainly if you have someone that has a more robust budget or resources a, a lot more you can get into but I think starting with the digital and the affordable slash free digital is really the way to go for those first three months. Awesome. All right Crafton if you were in that situation and you were a smaller restaurant maybe one or two locations, building a three month plan, what would you recommend do? How would you do it? Um, well, I mean, I think Amanda hit on a lot of great things, but uh, you know, in that, in that situation, I think one, you've got to take a look at your overall business, your overall business strategy and where you're at today. Um, you know, we've seen what, what's happened with the delivery business. Um, I think you need to really consider delivery and off-premise opportunities at, at large. Um, I, you need to, you should be getting your social media channels uh, engaged. Um, if, you, if they're not set up, getting them set up and start the message out there. But I think, I think that, you know, in this, in this next 90 day period, when you're leading up to, to, to holiday, um, in this world being as crazy as it is, you know, you should be putting things in action, but you should also, I think, be planning for the future and getting your foundational stuff right. So, so then take a look at, is it, what are the opportunities for your specific business your specific um situation right um are you have you been do you have uh an email database have you been tapping into that um do you have any sort of automated marketing that that's happening kind of in the background right that that you're getting that return on again you can do that for 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 low cost and it it's not going to change things overnight but you're building for the future so use this time um to to look at all the kind of key pillars of your business and the foundational pieces and work on those to strengthen them um, uh, that's really obviously on top of what Amanda hit on um, is is if you're going to be allocating dollars, um, you know, digital is is the right space to be doing it in because you can stay nimble and agile. Um, and, and the last piece I would say during this time, make it part of your routine um, and make a commitment to marketing. If you're stepping into a marketing role and you haven't been in one prior and, and you're, you're dealing with all these things, it can get lost in the shuffle. Um, and so I tell people first and foremost, make a commitment and then make a, make, make a personal time commitment and then make a financial commitment, come up with a marketing budget. Your organization will know what you can spend, whether it's based on a percentage of sales or it's based on you, 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 you have to determine that. And then you take that and then you can start to work on how do I want to spend it in the digital space? You know, how do I want to spend it on, on these other pieces of the business? 
Um, so I think I, I am just kind of going on top of a lot of what Amanda said, but make the commitments, um, work on, on the, the nimble pieces now, but set yourself up for future success. I think that's the, I think that's a huge piece. Thank you. You guys are, you guys are doing, given a lot of information right now, and hopefully we can expand upon it a, at another time. Um, cause we're almost running out of time here cause we have questions actually coming through, but <clears throat> so I have, we'll make this one really quick. People that are just jumped into the marketing role, they know nothing about marketing. Where's the one place that they should go to look for information to learn about marketing? Amanda, <laughs> I'll give it to you. They only, they only get one? Ah, um, I'm gonna cheat a little bit. It, it, <laughs> I, like there, there are so many, I love podcasts for anything. Like again, just, and, and I, here's the other thing I would say. Don't limit yourself to being inspired by marketing guidance for the hospitality industry. There's a lot of transferable principles. So I would find a marketing or PR or creative content, whatever you feel like you need for your organization. Find a great podcast that resonates with you about that. And to Crafton's point about making marketing a commitment in your day, if you are commuting into a physical office, you can make that a part of your commute. If your commute is walking into another room in your house, maybe that takes the place of your former water cooler chat. You just, you know, you kind of are that 10, 15 minutes in your ear. Um, if you can go one place, I think there's so many great voices for us to learn from. And if anybody wants to reach out directly, I'm happy to share my personal uh, podcast library. Oh, I'm going to be sending you an email because Crafton and I have been back and forth about which podcasts we're listening to. Okay, um, good. I will, so I'll, 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 I'll share, share my well. Yeah, yeah. So, okay, Crafton, now it's not podcasts. Where would, where would you go? Every time I go after Amanda, she says something great. I, I mean, podcasts, obviously, but, um, you know, there's a lot of online resources that based on, you know, depends on really what you're, what you're looking for. Um, I, you know, I'd say, you know, um, you know, find someone, um, either in your market or someone in your industry um, that that you know you guys most of you are you know, very well networked. Uh, reach out to me. Um, you know, I mean that's that's kind of what I'm really trying to do is is help people uh, when it comes to marketing. But um, yeah, I think I think if you, you you the podcast help with the motivation to do marketing, um, maybe more so. You know, and then there's a lot of good information, but it motivates you to to get out and do it. Um, and then, and then figure out the piece of the business you're going to focus on first, and uh, find a strong resource in that space. Um, and you know, I'm I'm here to, to answer any questions, or um, you guys can always shoot me a, an email or anything like that, and I'm happy to to give you any feedback. Awesome. So, okay, here's the last question from my questions, um, and then we have several from from the audience. So, what is the best piece of marketing and advertising advice that either of you have ever had in your entire life? that correlates with these crazy COVID times? And I'm gonna give that to Crafton first. I, we, we've talked about this a lot today. I, I think it's the most simple thing and it's listen to your guests, your community, whatever your community may be. Um, I, I think, you know, as a, as a young marketer, it was always like, I wanted to go do these big things and these big events. And, you know, I wanted to, to host, you know, X, Y, and Z. And um, it was always this, this really big stuff. Um, and I, and, 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 you know, as I, as I grew as a marketer, I realized that there's a ton of value in, in that. And um, I think I've talked a lot about that on today's call, but, you know, when you talk about marketing made simple, I think that's the simplest way in, to do it. Um, and I also think it's the, one of the most overlooked ways of marketing. Marketing one-on-one -on -one, um, is, is you, you know, having a voice to, to people. Um, it's, it's, you know, again, it, it takes a commitment, it takes a con time commitment. Um, but, you know, listen openly, take the feedback and, and let it help you become a better restaurant, a better hotelier, uh, you know, a better marketer, right? You know, whether it's, you know, feedback on what you're putting on social, et cetera. Awesome. And Amanda, what is the best piece of advice that could correlate to today in the COVID environment? I think that um, I'm going to go on top of Crafton now. That's based on what he just said, but I still feel like I remember exactly where I was sitting when a really valued mentor said to me, you know, we had a good marketing at its core has to include 
a deep understanding of your target market, their lives, their joys, their fears, their their day to day, their hopes and dreams. And until you understand their story, you will never be able to craft how your brand is going to serve their story. And I've, I've never forgotten it. And I think that's super important for all of us to remember right now. And it's also a good reminder that for all of our target markets, you know, that, that deep understanding, that's changed a lot in the last nine months. And there is opportunity in chaos if we can figure out how to change with it. That's good advice. I, uh, there's a book out there. It says obstacle is the way. And if you look at it's on my bookshelf, it's so good. It's literally, I don't think I can't figure out which angle it's right back there, Kim. That's a good one. Everybody that's should a great book because you know, it, an obstacle doesn't have to be something that's negative. It could be an opportunity. And if we look at it, I mean, we wouldn't be having this conversation right now, you and me and Crafton, and we wouldn't be having this and having an, an audience if there wasn't COVID. And I think it's, you know, it's beneficial that we look at it as an opportunity and not an obstacle. So um, we have a few questions, which are gonna have to get through relatively quickly. So one of them is, um, what type of partnership should hotels or restaurants be pursuing to increase traffic? Are they feeding off of each other? And I know, Amanda, you have some restaurants inside of, inside of your facilities and, and, and hotels, but are you guys utilizing anything outside of that and working off of each other uh, that way? So I'll give you a quick example, um, because I think there are a lot of, my hotel has 13 restaurants, so that it, it maybe not as transferable, but like right now we're in the process of developing some great packages that speak to families doing virtual learning within a hotel. So we've partnered with um, a, a lot of different organizations in our community. We even have some outside restaurants doing cooking instruction, but art museums and zoos, and I, I think there's never been a time, a better time for partnership to broaden business value for both organizations. And I think putting myself back in, you know, now I'm, I'm a boutique hotel and, and maybe when people are choosing to get away right now, they've been in quarantine for a while. They do not want to be in charge of feeding themselves. So if you don't have awesome food and beverage options on property, it's a great time to seek out a partner. And I, there's probably some great delivery synergies for a lot of players. Awesome. Thank you so much for that. Now, Crafton, partnerships. I know it's different. You're not really talking about hotels because a lot of the restaurants that you've worked with aren't really hotel or like on the beach or anything, but partnerships for you, how does that look for you? Yeah, for, for me, I mean, it, it's it's very much dependent upon the, the type of restaurant we're talking about and the community that it falls within. Uh, but some great partnerships out there are, you know, large youth sports leagues um, are a great way to get in that, that, that are really cost effective and you can get signage and on-site opportunities to bring your food, things of that nature. Um, you know, those that, that know me, you know, I, I love, um, you know, charitable partnerships. Um, you know, and there's always, you know, again, whether it's with a, a, a well-followed local uh, charitable organization, or maybe it's a larger organization that has a really strong local footprint. Um, you know, th those are great. There's there's tons of different uh, networking groups out there that can help open up doors, whether it be like the BNI groups, the Chamber, I mean, the Chamber of Commerce. I mean, there's so many different ones. Obviously, uh, you know, the Restaurant Lodging Association. You know, but there's there's so many that that can help open up other doors. Um, and I think when you create that that true relationship, true partnership, um, it is is really how it all unfolds and, and, and what opens up. There's also great partnerships with for-profit businesses that um, you know you can tap into as well. Whether you're you're you're, you're catering large luncheons or, or whatnot. Um, so the, the the number one thing I think is to create the conversation and find the things that 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 you're passionate about when it comes to a charity. Find find what makes you what drives you. Um, and, and that'll make you want to do it more and, and it becomes more impactful and your teams will buy in more, um, which will also um, get the community more excited about, about what you're doing. So uh, there's a lot of opportunity. And again, that, that depends. If, are you more of a family restaurant, more of a fine dining, more of a casual? You know, there, there's a lot of elements there, but um, those are some general ones. 
Yeah, I know that I believe Kraft and I think you did something with Metropolitan Ministries somewhat too. I know we did stuff with NPCF, which is the National Pediatric Cancer Foundation. Yeah, um, yeah. we had a really uh, successful uh, partnership with National Pediatric Cancer Foundation uh, 2019, we raised over $156,000 for them. Um, a lot of help from actually the PPK team. Um, great organization, one that I, I was passionate about, um, and as well as some other people on the leadership team. But uh, there's there's some really good organizations doing some amazing work uh, out there, and um, and they're typically ran uh, by boards that are very well connected in the community, which is another uh, opportunity to open up doors. Absolutely. So I have one last question here from from the audience, and it says. What can you do grassroots if your boss isn't able to allocate budget right now? So let's say for instance, there is this much money in that marketing budget. What is the first thing that you would do? And I'm gonna throw this to Amanda. So I think um, that's not abnormal right now. And budget has to be earned, right? So sometimes it's showing what you can do with nothing that's going to get you your first little piece of something. And that's why tracking and showing return on investment, both of human capital, both of your time, and then your boss's money, I think is, is so critical. So I would recommend, again, um, we've talked about some of these things already, but starting social media is, is not you know, gonna cost us anything. Looking at some influencer partnerships you know, is your boss okay with um, perhaps an, an invitation to dine or stay that's kind of an in-kind trade, but we're not outlaying hard dollars? That That is an exceptional way uh, to kind of, again, increase your, your content library, like Crafton and I both spoke about some, some photography, engaging in traveler reviews uh, and, and uh, diner reviews. That's, a, again, a great way. All of those are putting your message out into the community. I think sometimes when we haven't done marketing before, we fall victim to thinking, well, I can only get my message into the community if I, I purchase a digital ad or, or I, I bought, buy a glossy or TV or radio. And I'm not diminishing the value of these things. They produce investment and or produce great returns, but it's not the only way. So, so don't don't think that money has to be behind the message. And then I would also say, great ideas are free. And if you are listening to what your customers are looking for, and come up with a truly unique way to fulfill it, you're going to be in a viral marketer's dream where your customers are gonna start telling your story for you. And they're gonna do it on social and they're gonna do it via word of mouth. And then again, to piggyback on something Crafton's talked about quite a bit, but I think it's important with a, a zero budget. Community partnerships, again, they require some uh, in-kind service outlay, um, but often there can be tax benefits. So companies look at those differently than again, a, a hard outlay of, of cash. That can also be a, a zero to you know negligible way to get your message out into the market. So I think focus on those channels, but also focus on the great ideas that nobody is. To, you know, I'll give you a great example. Um, way pre-COVID, I can't remember. This is probably 2007 or eight. We had a real need period at the JW Marriott Marco Island. And it was at the same time where the big medical buzzwords were all about fertility. It was during loggerhead turtle season. So we came up with a fertile turtle package. Okay, right? Again, we're back. At, Kim's laughing. Okay, so I think we might have actually sold 20 of these packages, but it was so out there in the market, right? Um, this is when baby moons and conception vacations kind of started out that we earned probably 20 million in ad value with people picking up and talking about these things. So don't diminish the power of a really great idea or offering that people are going to talk about for you without you having to pay them. 
Yeah, I, I'm not. I'm not going for the fertile turtle thing. Sorry, I, I'm done. You know, it's, it's, it's it's so we're, we're not there, but I'm. I'm telling you, you would remember it. I would. I totally remember. I'll never forget it now. But I. I'm not going to be. Um, yeah. You're not a consumer. Like, You're not a buyer. <laughs> okay, Crafton. So I don't. I don't know how I back up the fertile turtle, but um, <laughs> I'm sorry. I, I. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I hit on so many great points there. Uh, the the really the only two I think I can go on top of is say. You know, one is 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 you know, hey, go old school, guerrilla marketing. Get out of get out of your four walls. Just talk to people. Go into businesses. Go into churches. Go into schools. Go into anybody that'll talk to you. Right? That's old school. Get, go out to local when events come back. You know, things of that nature. Obviously, um, uh, the the other piece I would say is um, you know, you you've got the power of food or you've got the power of hotel stays. So so you use that to your advantage. Um, but if you really have zero budget and, and you, you can't even really get away with giving away much food, look at opportunities for like shared cost events, which is basically going to hotels or going to different places and, and, and work out shared costs where they're basically, you're just asking, cover the food cost. We'll cover the labor. We're not making any money on the deal, but it's going to allow us to, to, to get our, our, our food in people's mouths and, and talking about it. Um, so that's a that's another way I think that's you know often underutilized is just that kind of shared cost where where you know you're splitting the uh, the budget and, and you're you're able to recoup some of that food cost. So, um, but outside of that, it's everything that that I mean, it, and we've talked about all day. It's it's social, it's it's social listening, um, and it's it's having conversations with your your uh, guests and your community. Well. That because that's like the conclusion of our, our webinar here. But I want to first thank um, Zenith Insurance for sponsoring this. Um, number two, FRLA. And if you're not aware that there is a summit coming up um, in October, and I really want to push this because if you have an opportunity to travel, I would love to see you there because there will be several several of us there, including my better half. That's better on radio than on TV. So. Um, and I'm going to patch, uh, pass that on over to Ashley. But thank you, Crafton and Amanda, so much for uh, participating and giving your insight. So I look forward to speaking to you soon. I'm going to definitely find out your podcast. So if you can find me on LinkedIn, um, what I will do is I'll, I'll get a list of their podcasts and mine, and we'll put them together, and I'll put them out there. So look forward mm -hmm. to it. Thank you, Ashley. Thank you, Thank you, everybody. I really appreciate your time and you've been wonderful. So this webinar is being recorded and will be available on the FRLA YouTube channel after this webinar is over. And I thank you again. Thank, thank you. you. Mm -hmm.